Don't you know nobody? started at seven o'clock and uh, people start coming on here. Um, welcome to Sandy Branch uh, Baptist Church on Wednesday night Bible study. We are going through the book of John. We are in chapter 18 if you want to go ahead and turn there. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start with prayer. I don't think we have any announcements other than uh, Sunday worship at uh, 10 15 for um, Sunday school and 11 for uh, church service. And uh, we are going through Hebrews in uh, that church service. And so I hope you join us. Again, um, pray for those who are in need uh, here at the church. Um, I know Danny had surgery and... Um, uh, and... Not sure if there's anything else. Can't think of anything. Um, so continue um, praying for our leaders here at the church and in our nation as well. Um, and I think that's about it. Let's go ahead and get started in prayer. Our gracious God, we come to you and we thank you for your word. I thank you that you have spoken your word to us. You have uh, sent your word to us through your son, Jesus Christ, who is the word, the manifested word of God. And so, Father, I pray that you will continue to uh, speak to our hearts, continue to speak to those who, um, who don't know you. Use us, Lord, to go out and proclaim the truth so that those who are in the truth can hear the calling and, and respond and and uh, and receive salvation, salvation from your wrath. So, Father, I pray that you will continue to move in us. I thank you, Lord, that you are a compassionate and loving God who is forgiving. But, Lord, you have wrath. You have wrath, and you, uh, you will not let those go unpunished who do not trust in you. And so, Father, I pray that you will continue to save and you will use us to, to uh, go and proclaim that gospel, that good news of Jesus Christ and how he uh, came and lived a life in the flesh, lived the perfect life and died the perfect death and rose again and is seated at the right hand of God, the right hand of you, Father. I thank you. I thank you that uh, you have made a plan for us so that we can be in your presence, so that we can be one with you. So thank you, Lord. Uh, again, teach us tonight through your word, and um, I pray that you will bless us in this time. And I ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, tonight <clears throat> we uh, are going to start chapter 18. Chapter 18 uh, begins with a kind of a narrative. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it is a narrative um, of how the disciples and, and Jesus have, have left the, uh, the upper room. They have gone out of the upper room. And while they're going to this um, garden, which is the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, they are crossing over the Valley of Kidron. And um, as, he, as they are doing so, they are, uh, Christ is talking to them. He's praying for them. Uh, so there's a, a number of things that are happening uh, up to this point. In chapter 18, what we see here is that um, Christ has spoken these words, uh, which is the, the, priest, the high priestly prayer. He's, uh, he's, he's given the high priestly prayer, and now he is moving forward. Uh, to the hour which he came for. This is the hour where it will be his betrayal, it will be his trial, and it will be his crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection. And so uh, it, it, this will take place within the next couple of chapters. 
John ends in chapter 21, and we're in 18. So, um, what I want you to see, though, is that uh, uh, John doesn't really go into detail about the, the garden itself. Um, he, uh, I don't know why uh, he steers away from that when the others have, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have, um, have given a little detail of the events that took place in the garden. But um, John uh, tends to stay away from that, and uh, I think he, um, um, I, I, I think it's, it's for a purpose as well, and, and we'll see that as we go. Um, but, um, but what we'll see in chapter 18 is that Jesus has spoken, and, uh, and he's moving forward, and I, uh, I think that's... Uh, it, it, like I said, with the narrative, it's not going to be so much in depth. So tonight, let's just go ahead and get started, and uh, we'll see what, what comes of it. When Jesus, in verse 1 of chapter 18, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron, uh, where there was a garden, and this is the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, Kidron um, uh, is like a, a ravine, uh, a winter torrent, basically. Um, from what I understand, um, the the blood of of a lot of the sacrifices would of the temple would would run down that valley brook, that torrent, winter torrent. Um, the winter torrent br brought uh, rain. And so there was, uh, that's where you've got the little brook that, that goes there. But then you cross over that, the Kidron Valley and you go up into the um, Garden of Gethsemane where all the olive trees are. Now, the, the, the Gethsemane means olive press and, uh, or oil press. And so what you're, what you're seeing here is, is Christ is coming out of the city He's going up into the valley, I mean, uh, over the valley, and then up into the garden where he goes with his disciples often. Uh, when he's in Jerusalem, he's, he's with his disciples there often. And, um, and this is the place where Judas knows that he's going to be, okay? So he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron where there was a garden in which he entered with his disciples. Now Judas also, who was betraying him, knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Now, what you see here is that Judas is bringing with him uh, the Pharisees, uh, probably chief priests of the, of the Sanhedrin, part people of the Sanhedrin, uh, and um, uh, a Roman cohort, which is about six, 600 men, 600 to 1,000 men. So, um, so, and then the, um, the, um, uh, the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin would also bring a, a temple... Um, I, I guess it would be an army or, or guards. And so there was probably about, uh, I would say about 600 to 1,000 men that came to this garden uh, to, to get Jesus. Now, they could have gotten him any time. They could have gotten him in, uh, while he was speaking in the temple, but uh, they, they never did. In fact, the people said, you know, how, how is this man able to talk, Let, talk this way? And um, do the chief, the, the, the priest, do they agree with him? You know, that's, these are the questions that they're asking. Why are they not uh, arresting him? Or do they, are they okay with this? That kind of thing. And so um, uh, we studied that earlier. But, um, but no, they, they go in, in the dark of night. And so um, Judas, who uh, went and betrayed Jesus went to the, um, the Pharisees and uh, betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. 
uh, is now leading the pack and, um, and the cohorts and leading them straight to Jesus. It says, Jesus, uh, Judas, then having received the Roman cohort and the officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Now, they came with these things because, number one, um, there is a possibility that um, uh, there, there would be an uprising uh, with, with the people if they arrested Jesus and the disciples uh, maybe attacked or uh, Jesus' disciples attacked or went and told people and there was an uprising. But you have to think about this because um, you, you think about the Jews, um, they didn't want Jesus to cause this uprising and then they would, the Pharisees would lose their positions uh, in a rebellion and things like that. So um, they didn't want an uprising. And so they went with all these people all these uh, soldiers, uh, just in case. And they all had weapons and torches and lanterns. So Jesus, knowing all things that were coming upon him, in verse 4, went forth and said to them, Who do you seek? Now, it says here that he went forth. So what he's doing is he's stepping forward. Um, he's in this garden. They have come. Judas has come straight to him. With all these men, torches, weapons, lanterns, comes straight to Jesus. Jesus steps forth in front of his disciples and and uh, and comes toward uh, the uh, the these the soldiers and Judas because uh, this is his time. He's not going to run and hide. He's not going to hide behind his disciples. He's going to step forward, and and uh, this is the time, this is the purpose, the reason why he's come. So he's stepping forward, and he says, Whom do you seek? And they answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. And he said to them, I am. Now, right there, that word, again, it's the word um, that, that for the name of God the Father, Son, and Spirit, the I Am, Yahweh, uh, the great I Am. When um, uh, Moses said, who, who should I say is sending me? And God said, I Am. I Am that I Am. He's, this is it. I Am. This is the Word. This is the Septuagint uh, version of the Word. It means, it, it, it's this word, ego in me. And it, it is, I am. This is the name of God. So it's kind of interesting when he says this, right? It says here in verse 5, And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. Therefore, he, um, so when he said to them, I am, this word, ego in me, uh, the name of God, they drew back and fell to the ground. Now, think about this. This is God's name. This is I am. And the power that Christ had in just saying the name. This, what they actually did, what these soldiers did, is when Jesus said, I am, when they're saying, who, who, Jesus says, who do you seek? And they say, we seek Jesus of Nazarene, the Nazarene. And he says, I am then all of a sudden, this, this word here means that they, they went backwards. They, they all went backwards. And not only that, they fell prostrate. So they, they went backwards and fell on their face. Straight on their face. You think about that. The power of God, just in his name. Just in, you know... Um, it, it just, with Jesus saying his name, it sent this um, cohort of army, uh, of soldiers, backwards and falling to the ground. Uh, it, it's just kind of amazing. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not account for this. I mean, as far as, um, as, far as these, these soldiers falling backwards and, and landing on the ground. But, um... But what you see here is just the power of God, just in him saying his name. 
I mean, you think about it. He's going to. He created the 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 world with the his his voice. He spoke. He's speaking here. Uh, when he uh, is speaking the word of God, it comes with power because it, it is it is saving people left and right. Um, it is calling people. It is the the power unto salvation is what Paul says. Uh, and then you, you see in the future that his word is going to destroy. His word is going to um, bring judgment and destroy with his word. His like a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth, and and um, and, and it's, it's going to destroy. But I mean, you think about this: it's the word of God, the power of, of God's word. And um, and here he is saying, "I am, I am," just the name of God, and they draw back and fall to the ground. Now, I don't know how long they would have stayed there, <laughs> to be honest with you, because what you see here is he says, therefore, he again asked them, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene. So he asked them again, you know, after they've fallen down on the ground and they're prostrate on the ground, uh, he's, he's asking them, whom do you seek again? Because um, I, I don't know. I mean, to be honest with you, I don't know how long they would have stayed there on the ground. Um, but he asked them again, and they said, Jesus the Nazarene. And then Jesus, in verse 8, says, I told you that I am he, I am. So if you seek me, let these go their way. So what you see here is the shepherd defending his sheep. You see what Christ said in, in, in chapter 17. I have not lost one, right? He's saying here, I have not lost one and I'm not going to start losing them now. So he goes, uh, he, he goes, forth before his sheep and he asked who who do you who are you seeking and and because he wants them to um to arrest him and not his sheep he says i i um if you seek me then let these go their way so th this is the power also that he has to protect his sheep uh they they comply they comply. They they let the disciples go, um, and it says to fulfill the word which he spoke in verse nine. Of those whom you have given me, I lost not one. As you think about it, I mean, what do you think if, if if the disciples were arrested right then? How you know what what do you think it would have done to their faith? Um, I I don't I don't think uh, I don't think they would have stuck around for one uh, I mean as far as like uh, uh, stuck to him I think they would have denied him and every one of them would have denied him and and uh, but also um, I, I just don't uh, I don't foresee them uh, their faith being that strong in, in the first place but because Christ has prayed for them see that's the thing Christ has prayed for them that, that they would remain faithful, even the, the little faith that they do have. And um, that's the difference between Peter and Judas. See, Christ didn't pray for Judas. Um, he, did, he didn't lose Judas either. Judas was, um, was uh, chosen for a purpose, and that was to betray Jesus Christ. So Christ is not praying for Judas. You know, he's praying for his disciples, his chosen ones. And so even through this time, so that they would not uh, lose faith, he's saying to the soldiers, you know, let these go. Let these, let my sheep go, basically. So he's standing in front of his sheep and defending his sheep, even at this moment. He says, um, but here, Simon Peter, verse 10, Simon Peter then, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave, cut off his right ear, and the slave's name was Malchus. Okay? Um, so what you have here is, uh, uh, you know, Peter, who is very zealous, and um, 
you know, you, you think about what he said um, a, a few chapters ago where he's like, I, I'll never leave you. I, I'll go with you to the very end. No, I'll, I'll, I'll die for you. And, and Christ said, Peter, uh, you, you, uh, you know, you, you're going to deny me three times. You know, this is, this is the reality. This is the truth. Um, you may get a little zealous now, but, um, but you're going to deny me three times. And um, so it, it's kind of amazing that he steps forward here with this zealousness. And then we see in the future here in the, in the, in the next couple of verses, just how, just how faithless he was. And, um, and so, in fact, um, it's kind of interesting. I, I'm trying to think here. Uh, let's go to Luke. Turn to Luke 22. Yeah, I think it's right around there. And he says uh, in 22, verse 31, um, uh, let's see. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But uh, here's the comforting thing. But I have prayed for you and why that your faith may not fail and you listen to this now this is really cool when once you have turned again strengthen your brothers so number one jesus has prayed that that uh peter would not lose faith that his faith would not fail because satan has demanded permission to sift Peter like wheat. And he says, but I have prayed for you. There's going to be a, a trial that's coming, Peter, but, but I've prayed for you. There's, there's going to be a, um, um, a sifting going on. And, but I've prayed for you. And you're, you're going to feel like crud, uh, you know, for a while. But when you return, when you return, when you repent... That's what it, what it means when you repent. When Once you have repented and turned again, strengthen your brothers. But he said to him, Lord, with you I am ready to go both to prison and to death. And he said, I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied me three times that you know me. To deny that you know me. And um, so... You know, it's it's a pretty sad time for Peter, um, but uh, but Peter, I think, said, feels like he's got something to prove here, so he's going to whip out his sword and he's going to cut the ear off of this slave, <laughs> not a soldier, but a, a slave, because um, it says here the slave's name was Malchus. Uh, I think I think John is the only one who actually names the the slave. Uh, we see that Jesus reaches down, and, and it doesn't say here that that Jesus healed Malchus's ear, right? But in other gospels, we see that that Jesus actually heals the ear of Malchus, and which is an amazing thing because here he is getting arrested, and he's doing a miracle, you know. And I think that may have been. That may have been his last miracle. Yeah, I think so. I think that may have been his last uh, before the the um, the resurrection. So, um, so what you're seeing here is that Peter is, is zealous, right? He's gonna pull out, strike the the slave's ear, and he's going for his head, of course, but he misses and cuts off his ear. And it says here, uh, so Jesus said to Peter. Put the sword into the sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? You know, it, he's saying here, look, it, this isn't how it's going to be done, Peter. We're not fighting with sword. We're not, we're not going to be fighting with sword. We're not going to, this is now not how my kingdom is going to come into being. We're not going to be fighting with swords. Um, uh, Christ is saying to Peter, I have to drink this cup. I have to do this. 
This is why I came. Uh, go back to Luke uh, 22. So, um, and this is the, um, the betrayal here. It says, while he was still speaking, behold, a crowd came and the one called Judas, one of the 12 was preceding them. And he approached Jesus to kiss him. See, we didn't see that in John as well. And, but Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying me, the son of man with a kiss? When those who were around him saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, Stop, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come against him, Have you come out with swords and clubs as you would against a robber while i was with you daily in the temple you did not lay hands on me but this hour and the power of darkness are yours so and then it goes into um uh peter's denial and that's in luke 22 but you see here the the disciples are like shall we shall we take him with sword shall we strike with a sword but this is not how this is not how it's going to be done. Um, so uh, Jesus doesn't come with sword. Uh, you think about other religions and uh, they use the sword. Um, you you can talk about the Crusades uh, all you want, but um, the the Crusades were uh, not about gaining people um, in the kingdom of God or, you know, winning people to the kingdom of God. Uh, that, that had nothing to do with the kingdom of God. Uh, anything. We, we don't take the sword in hand to win um, kingdom, the kingdom of God. It just doesn't happen that way. We go out and we lay down our lives for people. Just as Christ laid down his life for us, we go out and lay down our lives for others around the world. Uh, missionaries uh, lay down their lives. They don't go and, and uh, war with uh, other countries uh, to win them over to, um, to in, in battle over to the kingdom. That's just not how it works. Uh, we go and we lay down our lives uh, in, 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 in a sacrifice, a sacrificial way, um, we put their lives at interest more than our own. That's how we win the gospel. I mean, why, how we win the kingdom. We, we go and, pro, and proclaim the gospel even when we're under attack. I think about Jim Elliot. You know, Jim Elliot had guns, uh, from what I understand, uh, and they never used them. And here they are being attacked. Yeah, but they never used them. And the, for the whole purpose of, of winning these people, the, the, these, um, these uh, native people, in, um, to winning them to Christ. So uh, this is just things we have to think about when it comes to um, our zealousness. Basically, we, we lay down our lives sacrificially for others so that they can hear the kingdom, so that they can hear the gospel, so that they can become part of the kingdom. And so, um, but here we see uh, in verse 11, Jesus said to Peter, put the sword into the sheath, the cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? And this is the cup of God's wrath being, it, it, he's going to have to drink that. He takes that, uh, uh, and, and we'll talk about here, we'll stop and talk about this, kind of unpack it a little bit. The cup that he's talking about is the wrath of God. He's, he's going to take that wrath for us. And this is what we, we talk about, the substitution. Uh, the imputation and, and substitution. 
And, and these are the doctrines that, that take place on the cross, is that he's imputing to us his righteousness, and, he, and we are giving him our sinfulness. And we're placing that on him. We're putting our sins on him while he gives us his uh, righteousness. And then what you're seeing here is he's taking our place. He's substituting himself uh, in, in our place. And he's taking the wrath of God for us on our behalf. So that we will never have to experience. We will never get to drink this. We will never get have to drink this cup because Christ has done it for us. And I praise God. I praise God that uh, those who trust in him will never have to drink this cup. And I, I just, I, I praise God for that because that is the wrath of God that is poured out on him. And it will be poured out on non-believers in the future. Um, when when we're all standing there before the throne and those who do not believe, those who do not trust, that wrath will be poured out on them. And it is a cup that they will have to drink. But we won't. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are called according to his purpose now. See, I, that, that's, I love that. I'm, I'm, I'm resting in that. And so uh, I hope you are too. I hope you are too. Verse 12. So the Roman cohort and the commander and officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. Now they bound him. Uh, I don't know why. He was not gonna, he's not a flight risk or, um, again, they could have gotten him anywhere, anytime. And, uh, but they take him in and they, they bound him and led him to Annas first. For he was father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now, uh, Caiaphas was one who had advised the Jews that it was expedient for one man to die on behalf of the people. Now, again, I, this wasn't something that Caiaphas came up on his own. Uh, that God, because he was high priest at that time, uh, God... Uh, spoke through him uh, just as he did Balaam uh, you know and and uh, and bless the Israelites but he uh, used Caiaphas to explain that one man one man Jesus Christ was going to have to die on behalf of the people again that's that's substitution that one man is going to take the punishment for all of the people. And that's what he does for us. And so Christ was bound, and they brought him to Annas first, who, for he was father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now Annas was the high priest, um, and the Romans would, um, they would appoint high priests uh, themselves and it, and cause when you're a high priest it's like um, it, it's you're a high priest all the way up to a certain age uh, uh, you know where you're 55 you no longer do the I think it's 50 or 55 you no longer do the the the, the practice or the the ceremonial rituals uh, you know the younger crowd comes in to do that but you're still called a high priest you don't leave that position as far as your your title and that the fact that you are a high priest and he has a lot to say and um and then there's a lot of uh Caiaphas was uh the the son-in-law of Annas so um so it's in the family you know it runs in the family and here they are they're all working together um for the for the purpose of the Romans basically they get a lot of money uh, and they have a lot of power, and uh, Christ was the one who came in and kind of disrupted all of that. But here you see uh, that Christ is brought to Annas first, and then um, uh, now Caiaphas was one who advised 
the Jews that it was expedient for one man to die on behalf of the people. Uh, now, we see here that Simon Peter, in verse 15, was following Jesus, and so was another disciple. Now, that disciple was known to the high priest and entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. So, what we see here is John is explaining that there is this disciple, and John has a habit of not using his name very humbly, and so he doesn't use his name. Um, the, the, he usually says something like, you know, uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, you know, so he, so he won't use his name. Now, again, we don't know if this is John that's, that he's talking about here. Um, but um, there is a strong possibility that it is John because his relative uh, was, um, um, was a, a, a priest at one time. So th there's a possibility that it is John. So who knows? Because uh, it doesn't say. But we will um, speculate, because John has a habit of doing this, that it is John. So, but he um, got Simon in, basically. So Simon's like following behind, right? He's he's following Jesus and into the into the high priest area. And so there was another disciple uh, that was there as well. And this disciple was known to the high priest and entered with Jesus into the uh, court of the high priest. But Peter was standing at the door outside. So the other disciple in verse sixteen who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Okay, so now Peter's on the inside. Yeah, now, again, there's a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, I, I would say that Peter's like, I wonder what's going to happen, you know, he's he's curious, and 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 Peter has a lot of guts to, to actually follow and then go into the courtroom, basically, of, of the high priest. So he's he's kind of in this area, and um, so he's got a little bit of guts, right? Okay, and he's been led in by this by this other disciple, and so he's got a little bit of guts hanging around there, but then it gets a little hairy for him. Okay, uh, the slave girl who kept the door in verse seventeen said to Peter. You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. Whoa. First denial. Right there. First denial. Uh, this this uh, slave girl. This, um, uh, you know, ask him. Uh, and he's like, no, no, no. No, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not a part of it. So... That's the first denial. Now the slaves and the officers were standing there, having made a charcoal fire, for it was cold, and there were they were warming themselves, and Peter was also with them, standing and warming himself. Okay, now we go back into the um, high priest area. It says here that the high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples. Now, he's, he's at, they're asking him about his disciples. You know, who follows you? You know, who, who is it that, that, uh, that, that follows you so we can get them as well? Right? Um, it's kind of funny. I think about what, what happens today in, in this cancel culture of ours. And, and uh, if somebody says something and, you're attached to this person in some way. You're going to be canceled as well. And and uh, but but here you know you've got um, you know Jesus is being tried in these little trials here, and and um, and they're saying you know who are these disciples and and who follows you and and so they're asking about the disciples and about his teaching. So they're asking about the disciples and they're asking about Jesus's teaching. Now, mind you. These are illegal. These these court um, sessions here, this this trial that's going on, is illegal. It's it's happening late at night. That's not supposed to happen. Um, you know, the, they're they're um, 
they're questioning Jesus in a way that um, uh, it would um, it goes against what they uh, the, the laws that they have. Um, they don't usually what they would do is they would bring in witnesses and and the the witnesses two or three witnesses would come right and they would say. Uh, yes, I saw him do this, and I saw him do that, and um, and then he would be judged by that. But they don't have any witnesses. Now, eventually, they will get witnesses, and those witnesses will lie. Uh, those witnesses will say things um, that, uh, that, that aren't true, uh, talking about how he's going to destroy the temple. You know, they'll, they'll get these witnesses in here, and they'll, they'll start talking about that. Uh, but he, he wasn't talking about the temple itself. He was talking about himself, his body being the temple of God, um, that, that God is, is fully in him. He is a temple, and you destroy this temple, he's going to rebuild it in three days. And that's what he said, but according to the witnesses, of course, they're trying to convict him. So they bring in all these little liars, you know, and, and to, to say what they want him to say and to convict him. But here, uh, they, they don't have these witnesses yet. Jesus answered, and he says, I have spoken openly to the world. He doesn't say anything about his disciples. He says, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all the Jews come together, and I spoke nothing in secret. Everything that he spoke, even the Pharisees were there. Even if it was in the synagogue, the temples, at somebody's house, the Pharisees were always there. They were always following him around. And so he's telling them, look, I don't speak in in secret. I've, I've let everyone know the, the word of God. I've let everyone know you've heard the word of God. He's, he's letting everybody know that they've heard the word of God. Okay, and he doesn't do it in secret. And they had the chance to get him then. And why didn't they get him then? Right? That's basically what he's saying. Jesus answered, said, I've spoken openly in the, to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. And I spoke nothing in secret. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. They know what I said. They knew what I said, right? And what does that get him? When he had said this, one of the officers standing nearby struck Jesus saying, is that the way you answer the high priest? This is the first time here that Jesus is being struck. And um, you can go to um, Micah. Go to Micah here. I think it's Micah. Micah 5. Yes, 5 1. It says here, um, now muster yourselves in troops, daughters of daughter of troops. They have laid siege against us. With a rod they will smite the judge of Israel on the cheek. So what you're seeing here is prophecy. Now, um, this is also in Job. I mean, it, it talks about it in Job. It, I think, uh, well, let's turn. Job 16.10. Job 16.10 says, They have uh, gaped at me with their mouth. They have slapped me on the cheek with contempt. They have massed themselves against me. God hands me over to ruffians and tosses me into the hands of the wicked. And this is Job speaking. Just uh, truly amazing. I mean, this is back in Job. But what you see here is Jesus Christ being slapped in the face, hit in the face, um, punched, uh, and, and it just, uh, I don't know, it starts to 
I, I can see it. I mean, I can visualize this, you know, Jesus just answering the question and he's not smart about it. He just says, why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. They know what I said. In other words, he's saying, where are the witnesses? Where are the witnesses? They know what I said. Why don't you question them? And for him saying that, he gets he gets um, punched in the face. Punched in the face. And he says, is that the way you answer the high priest? And this is what Jesus said. Jesus answering him, if I had spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? Hmm. It's interesting. If I have spoken wrongly, which he hasn't, then testify of the wrong, which he couldn't. He says, but if rightly, which he did, why do you strike me? See, they hated me. They hated me without a cause. See, this is prophecy as well. They hated me without a cause. Uh, I'm not sure if that's in Psalm. I'm going to try. I'm going to shoot for it. Let me see. Let me go to Psalm. Fifty-five. Well, let's just read fifty-five. Um, give ear to my prayer, O God. Do not hide yourself from my supplication. Give heed to me and answer me. I am restless in my complaint, and I am surely distracted because of the voice of the enemy, because of the pressure of the wicked. For they bring down trouble upon me, and in anger they bear a grudge against me. My heart is in anguish within me, and the terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling come upon me, and horror has overwhelmed me. I said, Oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. Behold, I would wander far away. I would lodge in the wilderness. I would hasten to my place of refuge. From the stormy wind and tempest. Confuse, O Lord, divide their tongues. For I have seen violence and strife in the city, day and night. They go around her upon her walls, and iniquity and mischief are in the midst. Destruction is on her in her midst. Oppression and deceit do not depart from her streets. For it is not an enemy who reproaches me that I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me who has exalted himself against me, then I can hide myself from him. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, and my familiar friend, who we who has sweet fellowship together walk in the house of God in the throng. Let death come deceitfully upon them. Let them go down alive to Sheol. For evil is in their dwelling and in their midst. As for me, I shall call upon God and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning, at noon, I will complain and murmur. And he will hear my voice. He will redeem my soul in peace from the battle which is against me. For they are many who strive with me. God will hear and answer them. Even the one who sits enthroned from old. With whom there is no change. Whom do not fear. The, uh, and who do not fear God. He has put forth his hands against those who were at peace with him. He has violated his covenant. His speech was smoother than butter, but his heart was war. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. Cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. But you, O God, will bring them down to the pit of destruction Men of bloodshed and deceit will not live out half their days, but I will trust in you. Okay, well, that's not it. <laughs> but that is good. I love that. Psalm 55. It's a prayer for the destruction of the treacherous. Um, but um, I can't remember where that was now. Anyway, 
So, um, again, you know, the, it said that um, they um, they hated me without a cause. And here, there is no cause for them to hate Jesus. He hasn't done anything to them. Uh, he hasn't sinned against them. He hasn't sinned. And um, he has. he's innocent. And yet they have begun to try him and beat him. Uh, so it says here in verse 24, So Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So now he goes off to the high priest. And Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it. And he said, I am not. Second one. And one of the slaves of the high priest, being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter then denied it again, and immediately a rooster crowed. Um, in other Gospels, we see that, that Peter uh, got angry and cursed and, um, and, and said that he was not. And let's see. I think that might be in Luke as well. Let's see if I can go over one. What is it? One for two. Go to Luke 22. It says, Having arrested him, they led him away and brought him to the house of the high priest. But Peter was following at a distance. And after they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard, he sat down together. Peter was sitting among them, and a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the firelight and looking intently at him, said, This man was with him, too. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. A little later, another saw him and said, you are the one, you are one of them too. But Peter said, man, I am not. After about an hour had passed, another man began to insist, saying, certainly this man also was with him, for he is a Galilean also. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. Immediately, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. Now, here's an interesting thing. The Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Can you imagine that? Ah, it says here in verse 63, now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him, beating him, and they blindfolded him, and they were asking him, saying, Prophesy, who is the one who hit you? And they were saying many other things against him, blaspheming. But here we see Peter denying. We get another account here in Luke, where Peter is denying him, denying Jesus. And on the third time, Jesus looks at Peter, looks over at Peter. Oh man, that would that would have been horrible. That would have been horrible. I couldn't I couldn't imagine that. And I know that Peter says here that he left and and uh, says here Peter denied again and immediately a rooster crowed. But we see in Luke that he he went away and wept bitterly, um, because he had denied him. He remembered what the Lord had said. Just heartbreaking, heartbreaking. But you know, you think about Peter's zealousness was, you know, at the very beginning where he cut off the Malchus's ear, and and now he's denying, he's denying Christ. Um, but again, the mercy of Christ, the compassion of Christ. The forgiveness of Christ. I mean, you think about it. Think about, like I said before, how he told him that Satan wishes to sift you like wheat, Peter. But I pray for you. I pray for you. Now, here's the thing. Our whole 
chapter 17, when we were studying chapter 17, this is Jesus Christ praying for his believers, for his followers. Uh, you know, Christ prays for you. He is your mediator. He is your high priest. He is the one that goes in between. He is the one that is able to touch man and to touch God. And he prays for us. He, when, when we don't know what to pray for, he's praying for us. And not only that, the Spirit of God prays for us. Uh, when we don't know what to say, when we, we don't know how to pray, um, when we're, we're just at our wit's end, we have someone who prays for us. Now, that, that truly, to me, is, is an amazing thing. Because you, you sit there and you weigh it. I mean, you weigh it, you know, when you compare Peter and Judas, right? They both denied Christ. And here Peter is repentant. But Judas isn't. He's remorseful, but he's not repentant. And... At the same time, you have Christ that prays for Peter, uh, that, that prays for Peter, that he, and, and it even says that when you return, Peter, go and strengthen your brothers. And, and Judas goes and hangs himself and goes to an eternal damnation. But we have Peter here who's been prayed for, who is a chosen child of God, prayed for, knowing that he will come back, knowing that, that he will lead. Why? Because God has works for him. God's not through with, with Peter. God knew that, that Peter was going to deny him and uh, Christ, and, and, and God knew all of that, but, and God used Peter. God had plans for Peter. He had plans to, to use Peter so that the, the world will come to know Jesus Christ. Peter spoke, and 3,000 people came to, to Christ. 3,000 people uh, because of Peter preaching the gospel in Acts. Uh, it, it's just amazing to me that, um, that even, even at our, our worst, and I think back to Hebrews, you know, I think back to all of those people in the Hall of Faith in chapter 11, where they, they failed and, and so many times, and yet because of their faith and because of the faith that was given to them and because of Christ praying for them and, and loving them and, and having compassion on them and mercy, and um, but here, here's a, the mediator that's praying for them, the mediator that's going in between and, and able to touch man and touch God and and praying for them. And have these people have been chosen. And God's not going to lose them. God's not going to lose one. He's not going to let anybody get snatched out of his hand. And so when you, when you think about these things, you know, you have to think about that, yes, sometimes you're going to mess up. Sometimes you're, you're, you're going to, uh, uh, you're going to fall, right? But there's a difference of falling and getting back up and, and getting back on track and falling and staying in your sin and practicing your sin and continually being in your sin, continually getting drawn further and further away. There's a difference. Um, and so, uh, but you see, always see the child of Christ always coming back. Um, in, through in a fall in, in a in a um, a mess up and uh, they ask forgiveness and they move on I'm a perfect example and daily you know I, I ask forgiveness uh, I know um, uh, my wife and my family and, uh, and and my friends and they 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 know they're not perfect uh, but when they do mess up they they repent. They confess their sins, they repent, and they move forward. So, and we have a, 
we have a Savior that is compassionate and loving. And in that time where he knows we're going to mess up, uh, he still has great things for us. And um, that's exciting. And that, that's comforting. You know, that's comforting to know that that's our God. And that's, that's the one who loves us and the one who died for us. Um, so, believer, when you do mess up, confess your sins and turn back to him. He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Uh, see, that's, that's the beauty of our God. And so, so, trust him. Trust him. Don't run away from him. Trust him. Okay? So, we're going to end right there in, in uh, verse 27. And we'll pick up in verse 28 where Jesus says, uh, comes before Pilate. Okay? And, uh, yeah, and then, and then comes the uh, crucifixion and resurrection. So uh, we'll leave it there. I'm glad that you came and, and watched tonight. Uh, please join us on, on Sunday. We will, again, we're going through Hebrews. Uh, it's, it's been pretty exciting. Um, we're almost done with Hebrews. So, uh Again, thank you so much for, for coming here tonight. Know that God loves you. Know that he's uh, sent his son into this world to die for you, uh, to rise again so that you can have everlasting life, so that you can be in the presence of God blameless and holy and uh, spotless. Be in the presence of God for eternity. That's what he's done for you. Okay? Trust that. And so, um, believer, uh, I want you to hold to that. To hold on to that. That's your faith. And that, that <coughs> proves to you that you are a child of God. So, we'll finish with that. And a word of prayer. Father, again, we thank you for this time that we can come together and, and study your word. I pray that you will apply your word to our hearts. Let us know, Father, what we need to do. Move us so that we can proclaim, so that we can go out and, and tell others of, of how great you are and what you've done for us. Lord, I thank you that you are a God who, um, who loves us to send his son into the world, uh, that he can pray for us and, and, and ask for us. And, and, and when we need it, Father, we need him so badly. And we thank you that you have sent him into the world to do that for us. Our great Savior, our great and mighty God, Jesus Christ. And we come to you in his name. <coughs> Amen. All right, Sandy Branch, I love you. And we'll see you Sunday. Y'all have a good night.